Okay. I'm gonna give it about 30 seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, Jean. We are recording as well. Okay, it is nine o'clock. I'm gonna go ahead and get going as promised. So good morning, everybody. Exciting day. Thank you so much for joining. We are in for some amazing speakers. We have some great discussions coming, networking. I hope everybody is ready to thrive in HR. I am Sierra Pratt, the marketing manager at Star Staffing, and I will be facilitating today's conference. One of the amazing perks of pivoting to this virtual setting, um, though I know a lot of us would love to be in person, is we have just access to some of the most amazing speakers from across the country. We have Ben joining us from Alabama. We have Aisha joining us from Indiana. Um, and while many of our attendees are local from California, we also have folks attending from all over. So feel free to drop in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Say hello. We'd love to um, give you a quick hi. And all of your unique experiences will be extremely helpful throughout the day. Um, we're going to tackle some really important HR topics. So thank you for joining this morning. Really pumped for the day. This conference was designed to help you thrive this year and, and beyond. I really hope you enjoy each session, and I can't wait to get started. Here's just a quick breakdown of the agenda so you know what's coming. We'll start out the day learning how to focus data and purpose with Ben Banks. Hi, Ben. <laughs> then we'll have breakout sessions where you'll get a chance to connect with one another on topics that matter most to your organizations. We'll also have a very quick LinkedIn networking opportunity in those groups. So have your profile link handy. Also, if you can remember which group you signed up for, that will also be helpful. Uh, so you do have an opportunity to change if, um, if you choose so, but those will happen in a little bit and we'll explain more about that later. And to close the day, we'll get tools and inspiration from HR powerhouse, Aisha Alawadi. So excited to get started. And as you probably noticed, we are in meeting mode instead of our typical webinar, and that is to utilize those breakouts. Um, that also means that there is no Q&A, so everything will happen in the chat. You can also feel free to raise your hand during uh, any Q&A sessions. We'll do our best to call on you. Um, it is a pretty packed house today, so... Uh, please bear with me. We'll try to get to everybody that we possibly can um, for questions. And one quick pro tip on viewing our speakers today, you can go to the view option in the upper right and click view and do side by side speaker and it'll highlight just the speakers on the side of the screen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pop that into the chat as well, um, but that might help a little bit to manage um, the viewing. We are recording this conference, as I mentioned, so if you are taking notes and want to refer back, we plan to make that available, and any slides that are shown today will also be made available. And please also spend just a moment at the end of this conference sharing your feedback in the survey. It's going to pop up at the end of the session, uh, so if you can plan to just take, I think it'll take two minutes, maybe less, just to fill that out. You can also find that in the event follow-up. So if you're somebody like me that likes to digest a little bit before giving feedback, uh, you can look for that in that follow-up email. Okay, and now we get a chance to thank our amazing sponsors. So thank you to all of the companies listed here. We're going to take a moment to thank and introduce all of our amazing sponsors. Sponsors, feel free to come off mute and say hello or pop in the chat and say hi. First up, I'd like to thank our platinum sponsors. We have Western Health Advantage and Providence, and we have a few representatives from each. Hello to Jeannie, Teresa, and your teens. They are sponsors alongside our other platinum sponsor, Aero Benefits Group, and we welcome Mariah and team. We appreciate uh, both of your support, and we look forward to hearing more from both of you in a bit. So good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Our silver sponsors include Hannah Brophy and New Front. From Hannah Brophy, we welcome William and JP. And from New Front, good morning and welcome to John. Thank you both for your continued support. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Love this conference. Thanks for having us here. 
And at Bronze, we have innovative business solutions. Hi, Marie, and Exchange Bank, also at Bronze. We welcome Lori this morning. We appreciate you both being here as well. Thank you, Sarah. Love that STAR offers this to the community. So big round of applause, everybody. If you wanna hit your applause button, um, we just wanna say thank you to all these sponsors. They really step up every year. Um, all of these are, con are continuing sponsors, um, which means that they have joined us year over year, which uh, makes my job a lot easier. And <laughs> I really appreciate all of your support and all of you are just amazing partners. Um, and I just could not say enough nice things about all of these organizations. So I encourage all of our attendees to just learn more about them. They're linked in all of our materials and I'm happy to make any introductions. But um, again, just a really big thank you. Uh, we did make this conference free this year for the first time, which means these sponsors stepped up even more than they always do. Um, so again, just really big thank you to all of you. And before we get started, uh, congratulations to Greg Cisneros for being this quarter's standout uh, human resources leader in HR Jolt. You can check out his amazing story in this edition uh, of HR Jolt. It's going to be available in digital this week and will arrive via mail next week. So look for those uh, email alerts coming to you that those are on their way. You can request your copy today at starhr.com. We're going to drop the link here so you can sign up if you're not already receiving it. Um, if you're not sure if you're receiving it, or maybe you want to change your preferences, you can also click that link and uh, we'll get that notification as well. So super excited. If you know an outstanding HR leader with a story to share, let us know. You can send me an email, send us a chat here. Uh, we'd love to get those nominations. So I'd love to hear from you. And I would also like to thank our print sponsor, Minuteman Press, Santa Rosa, if you have any print needs, be sure to reach out to Greg. Uh, I am happy to do any introductions, but their team is amazing. Um, we are so grateful. So thank you so much to them. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mariah Shields with Aero Benefits Group. Mariah, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for sponsoring and we're excited to hear more about Aero. Good morning. It is very exciting to be here. Um, I have been in meetings since 6.30 a.m. So while I love the virtual world, why are people starting meetings so early? Um, don't they know I'm not a morning person? <laughs> but I'm so thank you for starting your meeting at nine. I find that much more appropriate. I feel ready to finally tackle the day and be here with you all. And I'm just so excited to be a sponsor. Um, I think Star Staffing does amazing work in the community and for their clients. And um, just a little bit about Arrow. We are a we are based in Petaluma, California, but we are a nat national brokerage firm and we specialize in group health insurance. I in particular really love working with nonprofits, um, construction companies and banks, usually between 20 and 250 employees. And I um, asked Dara to share two slides. One, it's, um, it was just International Women's Day and I wanna give a huge shout out to my coworker, Rosario Avila who founded Alianza at Aero, which is a, it's our Spanish language division, but it's really our bicultural division because so many of our clients have employees that would prefer to speak in Spanish and really have cultural differences to understand healthcare. And so she saw that need and founded Alianza so that we could really meet those needs and make employees feel comfortable utilizing the healthcare that their employers serve. And I just think that that's so important based on what we do. So I wanted to give a shout out to Rosario. She also helped me and my other coworker, Emily Wallace, found WO, W-O-A, Women of Arrow, which is new, and we'll be sending out more information on that coming soon. So I'm really excited about that. And then just as a reminder on my next slide, I just wanted to say, since we're talking um, human resources today, as a benefit specialist, I just can't encourage you enough to um, talk to your employees, see what they want. Benefits tends to be the number two or number three expense for most employers. So learning about what really is gonna be of value to your employees is so important. And that's an initiative I started at Arrow was really developing a robust employee survey program that talks about benefits at large. And I um, spoke about that at the last time I spoke at Star, for Star Staffing on some of the trends I was seeing. So 
if you have any questions about that, just let me know, but I'll, I'll end it there and just thank you so much for your time. Super excited to be a sponsor again this year. And with that, can I move on to my introduction, Sierra? That would be great. Thank you okay. so much, Maria. Yeah, absolutely. So I am so excited to be introducing Ben Eubanks today. Ben is a speaker, author, and researcher living in Huntsville, Alabama. Ben is the Chief Research Officer at Lighthouse Research and Advisory and the author of Artificial Intelligence, <laughs> Intelligence for HR, Use AI to Build a Successful Workforce. Previously an HR executive for a global technology startup, he currently heads up research and operations at Lighthouse Research and Advisory, a human capital advisory services firm. He works with HR, talent, and learning leaders across the globe to solve their most pressing business challenges with a research-based perspective tempered by practical, hands-on experience. He has developed hundreds of reports, case studies, and other resources to support his life's mission, which is making HR better, one HR pro at a time. Ben is the founder of Upstart HR, a blog that he that, he, that has touched the lives of more than 1 million business leaders since its inception. And he also hosts We're Only Human, a podcast that examines the intersection of people and technology in the workplace and has featured leaders from IBM, Emerson Electric, Southwest Airlines, and more. I believe that there's gonna be a link to the file in the chat, or I'm also happy to share it, but it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Ben Eubanks. Thank you so much, Mariah, and I'm so glad to be here, everybody. Looking forward to a fun conversation, and Sierra, once you drop your slides off, it says I can share. So, okay, perfect. Awesome. Hey, everybody. So glad to be here and looking forward to sharing some good stories, some research, some examples, and some hope with you as well, some encouragement right now. Um, in, the, in the last year and a half, all of my friends, or two years now, all my good friends in the HR world have I found that more than education, right, more than knowledge, they've needed some encouragement in the middle of all the stuff that you've been going through the toughest times in my working lifetime, essentially. And so I'm excited to share some of that with you today in the form of, again, some research, all that other fun stuff. So let's jump into it. I am hoping that at the end of this, you don't just say that was interesting or that was fun, but that I am fired up for each one of you can walk away saying that from this session because I want to give you some, some uh, ideas for that. So this, this idea of hope, giving you a little encouragement, by the way, is not an accident. I stumbled across that by accident, but now I use it intentionally on a regular basis. So about two years ago, uh, around this time, I had this schedule of travel and everything else kind of planned. And I got the, got the call one day when I was on one of those trips that said, hey, the world's shutting down. And so I decided I've got six weeks on my hands. I did not have otherwise. What can I do? And so I put together this experience for HR leaders just to just to kind of give them some some hope and encouragement in the middle of all all the stuff that's going on. And I got a note back from someone. I did this because I, I wanted to have some fun. I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to share. But I got a note back from someone who had gone through that experience. And she said, I was thinking about quitting HR. I thought this wasn't for me. You know, no one respected my, my voice at work. And I just thought that I was not cut out for this. And after the going through the event and the experience and making connections with people, she realized that the company did not respect HR as a function, but she still loved it. She actually renewed her hope and her excitement about the future of what she could do with a career in this space. And that note, I have it printed out. I have it keep it up here on my desk all the time because it reminds me of how valuable the work we do is and how much of an impact we can have when we come together like we are today. So I'm really, really glad that every single one of you are here. I'm going to ask some questions as we go through, let you chime in in the chat there, put your put your opinion in, share your ideas, share your thoughts and things, because that makes every one of us better when each one of you speak up. So you heard my, my bio, the stuff is not written in there. I'm a dad of four kids, 11 and under. So there's always some noise going on here. Uh, it's thank goodness for the, the quiet hours of the day that helps me face all the other stuff that is to come. And ice cream is a love language. I, if we ever get together, I don't do coffee, but I do ice cream. So we'll find a way to make that one work. If we can ever get back together again at some point in the future. So 
I'd love to see in the chat, I'll give you a chance now to chime into this. Who else out there, show of virtual hands or give me a response to the chat, who hates this term, the great resignation? Does anyone out there feel the same way as me that this is maddening and annoying and tiresome? Because I don't know about you, but every time I hear it, it grates on something deep inside me when I hear that come up. So, okay, let's let's check this. Yes, okay. I'm getting the, getting the thumbs up, getting the yes. Okay, Lori, awesome. William, a couple of you, perfect. Well, you know why I hate it, by the way? The reason I hate it so much is because this is the picture that they paint in the news, okay? We are standing right here, anchored to the spot. We are rooted, we can't move, we're stuck. And this tidal wave is coming to swamp us and crush us, and there's nothing we can do about it. And so basically, we'll just talk about it a whole lot and hold on for dear life, and maybe we'll survive this. And I hate that connotation because in my experience working in HR, there's almost always something we can do to solve a problem. There's often more than one thing we can do to try to solve a problem. And today, it is part of my goal is to give you some ideas on how to tackle some of the things that are facing us right now because we keep getting pressured by all these messages outside of our, our bubble in HR. People telling us, well, this is something you just need to accept. This is something that's gonna happen and you can't do anything about it. And I don't believe so. And I'm so, I was so skeptical of that that I actually put together some research on it. So we surveyed 2000 North American workers to figure out what really was happening. And so I'll share some of those stats with you today. But one of the stats that really hit me hard when I started doing the research and digging into the things that are happening in our world right now is this one. So when we look at the number of jobs for HR professionals, just like us, in the last year, those numbers have gone up over 600% past what the baseline expected rate was gonna be. So the government says, okay, we think they're gonna be this many, and no, we're, we're hiring for tons more. You know why? Every one of us here know why. Because all of a sudden, these companies that were thinking, hmm, we'll, we'll get to the people stuff later. We'll focus, yeah, let's focus on this, but then we'll get to the, that culture stuff, or we'll focus on our people, or we'll focus on better practices to actually listen to what our people need from us at some point in the future. And suddenly it came back to bite them pretty seriously. And so companies are now saying, okay, now let's try to catch back up. Let's try to bring on more HR staff. Let's try to solve this problem with technology. Let's try to bring these resources together, our trusted service partners, right? Like Star and others. We're trying to bring these people together to help us do what we've got to do and solve these problems. And nobody likes it when you say, I told you so, but we all, if, if we want to here, by the way, it's a safe space, we can say, hey, I told you so. We knew that this mattered. We've been trying to say that it mattered. And for those companies that are finally coming onto that, those leaders that are finally coming around to that idea, it's, it's eye-opening for them, but it's also validating for us to know that we've been on the right path and now they're finally coming alongside us to hopefully solve this problem. So today I'm gonna to give you three big things in the conversation that I've got in the next 40 minutes or so. I'm gonna give you three big things. Number one, we're gonna talk about the employee mindset today. I told you that research that we did, I'm gonna tell you what the workforce is thinking based on the actual data that we have. And some of it's maybe what you expect and some of it may surprise you. Number two, I'm gonna talk about the efficacy of care. We don't use the term efficacy very much in the workplace. It's often used as a medical term and it describes how effective a treatment is. And so I'll talk to you about this idea of caring for your people and how the most important relationship in the business for each employee can do that more, more specifically and more, more correctly, hopefully. And last but not least, I'm gonna try to, try to get this in before we run out of time. I wanna make sure and share with you the, the new evidence we have on the number one thing that employees are asking for. So there's, there's, a, there's a hundred different things and you'll take some good notes today as we're going through on, on different ideas for what you can do. And we heard already from Mariah earlier when she said, hey, listen to your people. They need these resources. You'll see that in the data, it's reflected there. And so I'm hoping that you get some good ideas to come out of this today. Again, not just the encouragement and all those other things that I'm promised to bring you in this. So first up, let's talk about the employee mindset. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And I wanna kick this off with a, a quick illustration that's so powerful to me. So when I was in college, I, by the way, I didn't tell you this at the beginning, but I knew I wanted to be in HR when I was a kid. I just didn't know what it was called. The, so I've, I've had this love of this all my life and I've got my fingers crossed that at least one of my four kids is interested in going into HR. I'm indoctrinating them very early on about how cool it is and how much fun it is. So I'm really hoping to bring one of them along in that path with me. But when I was in college, I was working for this company doing some 
office admin work. I was a, it was a small organization. So there were some accounting stuff, some HR stuff that I was doing. And I ran across this, some of these invoices that we were paying. And our engineers were building these amazing, huge machines that did all these complex things. And we had this invoice that said th two thermometers. One of them was $20 and one of them was $2,000. I thought this has got to be a mistake. You know, someone someone messed this up because why would we order two different thermometers on the same purchase order? One of them's 20 bucks and one of them's 100 times more expensive. So I went to our engineers and said, hey, I'm, I need to fix this. What's going on with this so I can correct the issue? They said, no, no, that's absolutely correct. Can, can someone explain that to me? This is not obvious to me. You know, I'm just, I'm just the admin guy. I'm just the college student. Help me out. They said, well, that." $2,000 thermometer goes inside the machine. It's measuring the process, the chemical and scientific process that this stuff's going through. And it's got to hit a certain precise temperature in order to complete that chemical process. Well, that's kind of cool. Okay. What about the $20 thermometer? Well, that one measures it right before an employee picks it up. Okay. So we're spending all the money and all the resources and all the effort to make sure that the work stuff is getting done. But the employee side of things, the part that measures someone's safety and their health, we're spending the bare minimum in order to get something just to solve for that. And again, as I, as I pointed out earlier, there are companies out there that are making decisions where the business and all the other functions get that $2,000 thermometer and HR gets what's left. The people get what's left. And increasingly, I'm talking to leaders that are saying, no, no, we are shifting this, we are changing this, we are prioritizing this, and we better darn well do it because as you'll see in the data I'm gonna start sharing with you, we have the chance if we'll take it. So this data, I'm going to run through a couple different slides here. I don't want to throw too many at you because I'm not a big fan of, of too many slides but I, or uh, too many charts. But I want to give you some ideas about what's happening in the world just to give you some sense of things. So number one, when we ask people who were planning to leave their jobs, one out of every four employees said, at some point in the near future, I am out of here. Okay, so this is not every employee. This is not 90% of them. This is a, a portion of them. And obviously this changes depending on the company size and the pay you offer and the industry you're in and those kinds of things. But broadly, let's say that one out of every four people that you have at your company statistically said, I'm, I may be leaving pretty soon. And we asked those people who had already left because there's a big chunk of those here. I quit my job already. We asked them if you left already, what things drove you away? And the things that were number one on that list, stress, burnout. Too much, too much, too much. The change, the constant back and forth, trying to figure out how to adjust all these new demands on me personally and professionally, that drove most people away. Many were lured away by, by higher pay or a better job somewhere else. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. I can't fault someone for taking a, making a decision to support their family or to support themselves that way. But that's something we have to think about because that adds opportunities for us to think about how pay and how a better job hmm, could fit into what we're offering people. And last but not least, the company's leadership, their policies, just the, the culture and approach here didn't fit with me. But watch this. You remember when you were a kid and you had those, those uh, you know, draw a line from this side to that side of the sheet to match these two things up? Well, one of the things we asked in there were, okay, why'd you quit? But what would have made you stay? Okay, so trying to get two sides of this equation to, to match things up. And in those things that you did as a kid and we had to try to match up and line things up that, that aligned with each other. If we were drawing these lines, I went ahead and did it for you, by the way, just so you see that. But when we start making those connections, there we go, pops up. We know they're leaving for these reasons, but over here on the right side, we see the things that would have made them stick around. Pay, better benefits, the things that actually meet the needs that they have and their families, that their families have more work-life balance, being able to support the things that they're trying to do. See, one of the things that we realized in this research is the great resignation, which again, I hate, is not exactly accurate. It's actually more like the great reprioritization where people are saying, I've realized in this reflection period I've had that these other priorities matter more to me than the job, or they matter more to me than a commute, or they matter more to me than whatever the thing is. And so they've started making adjustments about what priorities matter most in their life. And that, that's a challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity for us to listen in, to find out what cues they're giving us, and to find out how to solve some of those problems. And as you see here, when I've kind of drawn the challenges and the lines across two possible solutions, if the challenge was stress and burnout, well, guess what? Work-life balance gives us a chance to support that somehow by figuring out how to, what they mean when they, when they say that. 
or more flexibility. And I'll talk about flexibility at the end of the day because that's that's the thing that employees are clamoring for. And I will admit to you, because I've done this, I've been there, I've made the decision, we don't always listen and hear the thing that they're saying. When someone says flexibility, we may hear one thing, it's not the thing they're actually looking for. We're expecting it to cost this much and it actually costs this much. So I'll tease you with that one because I'll wrap up with that at the very end today. This is a fun one. We asked the question today about the candidate mindset. So if you accept a job, how long would you be willing to entertain other, other offers, other conversations about jobs? And so I'd love to, for you to chime in the chat. Let me know which one you think the blue line is here. Do you think it's male or female? Because we broke the data up between those two groups. We, we saw some interesting kind of divides here there and how they responded to this question. So do you think the blue is male or female when it comes to this one? I'm gonna take a look at my chat and see what kind of answers we could come in. All right, somebody said female is blue. All right, we got a male. Okay, we're evenly split. We need a tiebreaker. Someone throw it in there. Okay, blue is female. Okay, excellent. So Kim, Kathy, thank you. Erica, Linda, thank you all for chiming in. So I, I love this one because I got this completely wrong. I am a researcher. It is the work that I do day to day. And I think I know what I'm going to see sometimes in a data set. And sometimes it surprises me. So this actually, we look at the data, we cut it apart. The blue is actually women. And I'm going to tell you that I was a little bit surprised by this. Because in my head, I'm hearing this narrative that men are the ones that are going to say over here on the far right, for example, hey, I'm willing to accept an offer anytime. It just depends on the right offer. I'm always going to be open. Well, I expected men to be the ones to say, hey, I'm, I'm always open. I'm, you can't tie me down. I'm always keeping my options available. And yet women were more likely to say that, much, much more likely statistically than men. And so I was talking to a leader recently and I asked her, I said, what's your, what's your take on this? She said, well, yeah, that's obvious. I'm sorry, but it's not obvious to me. Can you please clarify that? What, what do you mean by obvious? She said, well, she said, I've worked in many roles in many companies over the years where they did not respect me for my opinions, for my perspective, for the value that I bring. And so if someone approaches me with an offer and they do those things, they tell me they see me, they tell me they're listening to me, they tell me and show me that they appreciate what value I have to bring, I'm gonna entertain this conversation all the time because I've worked in too many businesses that did not appreciate that about what I have to bring. And so that surprised me, just a little side, side conversation there. But, <coughs> excuse me. That surprised me because I didn't know what to expect with this. And now that's kind of formed, shaped my thinking around why the response came in this way. But I wanted to share this with you because years ago, someone accepts a job and they're in, they're locked down. And as you'll see here, if you start doing the quick math, the people here in the left columns that say, I've accepted the job, I am locked down, I'm good for a while, I'm not making any changes. That's only one out of three people. The other two out of three say, I'm gonna keep, keep answering the phone for a few weeks up until forever. They'll never be completely connected and tethered to that organization. So that just paints a picture of how much more transitory it has become to take jobs and change roles and move around in, in today's environment. It's become more common and more accepted overall among the candidate populations. We have some brand new data coming in, by the way, that uh, we, I, I'll share a stat with you in a little bit that I'll sort of pull from that because we just surveyed candidates on how they're seeing the work uh, market, how they're seeing the job market, the things they're expecting in the process right now. And some of those findings were, were incredible and surprising to me to see how much it's shifted over time. Now I'm gonna take you down a different, little different path here. We asked these questions about what matters to you, what makes you stay, but then we asked it differently. Sometimes I'll ask a question a little differently to try to get people to respond to see if they're they're in sync or if they're they're a little bit uh, if they're changing how they respond to those. And this different question we asked was, "What matters most to you?" We could have all these things in a job, and any of us could. The things that keep us connected, that make us feel like this is an important and useful piece of our time that we're investing. And when we asked the workforce broadly, it was work-life balance, it was comp, it was relationships. Those things matter most. But I'm going to take that a step deeper and I want you to watch what happens with this because while that seems pretty straightforward, hey, I'll take a screenshot of this, I'll go figure out this work life balance thing and we're good to go. Don't do that. Please don't do that because I want to show you this and get your take on what you see. So if you watch what happens when I break this out by age group and start looking at how those start to change, 
Oops. We'll see if you notice anybody notices this. So I'll give you a second to, to take a look at it. I'll watch the chat in case someone catches on to it pretty quickly. But when you look at these priorities by age group and start comparing them to each other, does anyone see the interesting thing that, that happens here? If you look really closely and you start trying to line these up across age groups, you'll quickly see that there are no two age groups that share the same set of priorities. And I was surprised by that, honestly. When you look at this and you, you expect to see some similarities there, and if we just grab that work-life balance piece that was overall the most important thing on that last slide, and we go in that direction, we are excluding, it's not even the top two priorities for those people who in our population are 45 and above, as an example. So we have to be careful about saying, well, this is the one thing that I can do to solve all the problems. I am a fan of high leverage activities for us where I can do something and it hits a, a broad population, a broad demographic in our workforce that we can, we can help so solve a problem for them or take care of them. But we have to be careful about assuming that everyone wants the same thing or that everyone is gonna be served by the same kind of thing. Because you see some interesting correlations where if you're very young or if you're a little bit more on the experience side in that age where you start mentoring others, relationships matter. But in the other areas, it's not in their, even in their top two, as an example. So all these kinds of things give us chances to understand our people more, to listen to them, and figure out what things matter. I'm going to pose a question to you here. So we see we see all these kind of things. I've shared all these, these stats and things with you, throwing all this. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Apologize. You know, all these things that I've shared with you. And I'd love to hear from you. Does this say, I'm out, you have no chance these people are saying, I've got one foot out the door and there's nothing you can do to save me. Or does it paint the picture? You've got a chance to keep me. You've got to take some, make some decisions. You've got to take some actions. You've got to actually do something. All right? What is it? What are they saying? There's a chance. Absolutely, Lisa. Yes. Thanks for chiming in there. There's a chance. We have an opportunity to connect with people. We have a chance to save them. Every one of them? Probably not. But do we have a chance to connect with people and create stronger bonds and make them want to stay? If we show them we listen, we show them we're trying to take action and solve for those things that matter to them, then yes, absolutely, we can do that. And so I'll get into, I've not painted this big picture of the challenge and how broad the problem is. I'll give you some examples of ways that we're seeing companies actually solve for this and create better results and better impacts there. So flip over to the efficacy of care, why care matters. So I talked about why, what that means. It's a treatment. Does it, does it actually lead to the right outcomes? And one of the treatments that I'm going to prescribe, if you will, for this is we cannot do this alone. Okay. Can I get an amen? We cannot wear, bear all the burden. We cannot feel all this on our shoulders. We cannot do this without some support from the work, the workforce and our managers are the front line of this. They're the ones interfacing directly with our people. They're the ones that have the strongest relationship with them. And they are also the ones that can negate every single thing we do in HR. If they create a poor relationship, it doesn't matter how much work we do. There was a stat a couple of years ago that said 70% of an employee's satisfaction on the job isn't dependent on anything that we can do. It's dependent entirely on that manager relationship. So that has to be at a good place or we're going to be banging our heads against the wall and not create the right kind of outcomes that we're looking for. So one of the things in this, in the study, as you can see here on the screen, one of the things that hit me is when we, I was looking to see how important is this? Maybe it's more important, maybe it's less important than it used to be, but how important is this? And we saw that if someone says, my manager does not support me, I don't feel supported by my direct leader. They were twice as likely to leave, not at some vague point far into the future, not a, I'm just generally dissatisfied. If they said I'm not supported by a manager, they were more likely, twice as likely to leave in the next month. So that we picture a leaky bucket. That's the, the visual that I think of. We're trying to fill it in. We're trying to recruit. We're doing all the work we can to bring in the right talent right now. But if we have these kind of relationships or lack of relationships, then we're trying to fill a leaky bucket and we'll never be able to fill it up. The easiest job to fill is the one where you retain that person because they didn't leave in the first place, which sounds so simplistic. And yet it's a chance for us to do that and solve that problem uh, that we're all trying to tackle with recruiting right now. So I want to give you an example here and tell you about someone that I, 
I love and appreciate this man. It's incredible. So the first HR job that I ever had, I worked for an organization. We had 600 employees and about 50% turnover a year. It was a real challenge. And you know the job that I had, right? My first HR job, you know what I was doing. I had all the files. I had all the new hire paperwork, all the termination paperwork. It was my job to do all the stuff, all the transactions that nobody else really wanted to do. So they dropped it on my desk. And the pay and the dues time as an early career HR professional, one of the things I started to realize as I was doing all this analysis was we had areas of our business where turnover was actually higher than 50%. That was the average across the organization. We had this division where I never saw people leaving. It was about 10% turnover. So I started digging into it, trying to understand what was going on there. And I found that the thing that set that organization apart in the business was that Antoine, this is a real guy. He lives about 30 minutes that way. Um, I haven't seen him in years, but I tell his story all the time because, because I think it's incredible. So Antoine was the leader of this division. And I went to spend some time with him to understand what was going on there because I, I thought we're, we are doing the, our employees were providing direct care for the developmentally disabled and the mentally ill. And they were doing it at very low wages. It was very hard work. It was stressful. It was, uh, there was shift work. It was all kinds, all the things in the check marks for this is going to be a really tough job. We checked all of those and we didn't check a, a box for high pay to, to balance that off. So it was really tough, but he was able to overcome some of those challenges. So I spent some time with him and the very first day I sat down with him to watch the shadow, what he was doing, he was welcoming a new person onto his team. And he said, let me grab a name. He said, hey, Tammy, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I am really excited about what you're going to bring to the team and to the organization. You're going to take care of these clients we're serving with such love and with such fervor. And I am so excited to see you flourish and grow here. I've I've got some ideas about where you can go and what your strengths are, but I'm going to take some cues from you as well on what you want to do so I can help you reach the career objectives that you're trying to reach. I'm, I'm honored to have you as part of the team. If you ever need anything, come see me. And I'm sitting here listening to him tell this person these things, this person who's never heard this probably at any point in their career because they're taking a job at $7.50 an hour. And I'm half tempted to quit my job in HR and come work for Antoine because he's so compelling and he is so connecting with them at the deepest levels of their heart. And I realized immediately what was setting him and his entire district, his entire function in the organization, his whole division oh, apart from everybody else. It's because that he really did care. It wasn't the flyby, oh yeah, I'm here and I'm gone tomorrow. No, it was, I am here with you. We are in the trenches together and I've got your back. I need you to have mine. And they could feel that from him specifically. So I'm going to give you a chance really quickly because I've, I've worked with people like Antoine a couple of times and they are incredible. And so I'd love for you to throw something in the chat really quickly. If you've ever had an amazing leader, actually what we've got we got plenty of time. If someone wants to come off of mute really quickly, that'd be even fine. I'd just love to hear a, a minute from, from you on a great leader you worked with, something that they did, something that really set them apart or a way that they connected with you and how you felt about that. Was well, somebody willing to, to jump in and, and share one of those stories really quickly? Because I love hearing about these other Antoines, wherever they may be. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, my name is Tiffany Smith. And I am uh, HR Director, Department of One in Detroit, Michigan. And for 12 years, I had the privilege of working for a CEO that was also a boots on the ground type of employee. Mm. He was very connected to all of us. He was very interested in our children, what our kids are doing. I have not worked for this man since um, 2014. He still calls me on my birthday every year. He still asks me how my daughters are doing. Um, I, what I found most rewarding about him is I started working for him right in the middle of a divorce. And at the time I had a three-year-old and a six-month-old. He was also a single father. And, um, you know, I had just started this job. I didn't want to tell him what was going on, but like he could tell there was some stress there. So he pulled me in his office and he was like, well, what's going on? So you know, I don't know what happened. Eventually I just broke, broke down in tears and I told him like, this is what's going on. This is where I'm at. I'm trying to make sure I'm doing my job, but I also have these responsibilities. And he told me right then, and he never broke his promise. He was like, as long as you work for me, you will never have to choose between this job and your children. Your children come first 
your family comes first. I will do what needs to happen for you to be able to do your job. And for 12 years of working for him, I never missed a parent-teacher conference. I never missed a band practice. I never missed a field trip or anything. And I have never in my life seen this happen, but the day he announced his retirement, there were there was only 58 of us at the time, 57 other employees broke down in tears in that conference room mm-hmm. because of his profound impact on us. And he's still like, people of, that still work at the company with me that still hear from him. It's like, oh, George called me on my birthday. Oh, George called me to tell me happy, Merry Christmas. And those are the kinds of things that, I miss because we have not had that type of leadership since and and it is very very sorely missed thank you Tiffany for sharing that story that is so so powerful I, I've got chill bumps over here when when he said uh, you don't have to choose between those two things I think that's a powerful example of great great leadership thank you for sharing that by the way um, I you know you reminded me I had some tears the day that my leader, I had another leader that I worked directly for. Her name was Christine and she challenged me. She gave me opportunities. She pushed me in areas that I didn't know if I wanted to be in and allowed me to, to really grow and flourish my HR capabilities, essentially. Like, I don't know if I want to be in recruiting. Well, here's you a job to go recruit for. Like those kind of things. She really challenged those, those assumptions that I had about what, what HR could be, what we could do, the impact we could have. And when she retired, it's the same kind of thing. You remind me of remind me of her with your story there. So thank you for sharing that, Tiffany. And for all of you out there, I love drawing these stories out. I love telling Antoine's story because it's a reminder that some days it feels like we're doing this with the managers in the organization nonstop. And everything that comes up is a battle. It's a fight. It's a, you know, which who's going to win? This is a zero sum game. Someone's got to come out of this. And one of my good friends is a marriage counselor. And he said, people make real change. They turn the corner when it comes to a challenge in a marriage, when they stop fighting against each other and start fighting for something together. I think that's the shift that we have to have when it comes to working with our managers. We have to find those Antoines, celebrate and elevate their stories. Let's tell everybody about people like the leader that Tiffany worked with and about the Antoines of the world and the Christines of the world and those people who are doing those things and taking care of their employees and serving them so well that if their leader happened to depart, that that person is in tears because they're gonna miss them. I think that's such a powerful indicator there. So I wanna give you some encouragement that these leaders do exist right now. There's probably one in, or multiple in your organization. And if you don't know who they are, spend a little time digging them up, finding them out because they can be advocates, supporters. They're already doing the right things and you can help to amplify their voices so that other leaders can take the cues from them and see what other behaviors they should be exhibiting. So speaking of behaviors that they should be exhibiting, We did some research a few years ago, and some of these stats will come from that, but there's also a a story I'll tell you in a minute, a case study that illustrates this so well. One of the things that we all know, if I put put you all separately in different rooms and said, okay, tell me something that a manager can do to connect with their people and create better lasting relationships, almost all of us would come up with, oh yeah, they should probably talk to them and meet with them regularly one-on-one. We know that's important and yet it doesn't always happen. It gets pushed to the back burner. It gets, you know, we'll get around to that. Oh, we didn't have time this week. We'll do it next week. When those things happen, we all know it. They're telling that person, you're not quite as important as everything else I've got to do. And when you say, I don't have time, you're saying, no, I didn't make the time for that. And so having those one-on-ones, I'll give you a stat in a minute that you can use. If you have some managers who are particularly unwilling to support that, I'll give you a stat in a minute that will that will kind of shock you because I put some actual numbers to this to, to make this feel a little more tangible because that feels so intangible. And I could give you story after story after story of different companies that are doing this. I talked to a, a friend recently that has a team of recruiters and she said, We're, they're getting calls from Facebook and you know all these big Google and the big companies that are trying to offer them all this money to come and work for them. And we've been able to retain every one of them I said, well, what's your secret? What are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm spending time with them individually, one-on-one. She said, in the last six months, my job went from 100% customer facing to about 40% customer facing and 60% just talking one-on-one with these people. And it eats up several days on my calendar every single week to do this and cycle them out, make sure everyone's being heard. 
but because I'm doing that, they feel connected and they are not leaving even when they're getting these incredible offers to come work somewhere else. So, all right, I'll beat that one for a little bit and I'll give you one more example in a minute of that. Recognition. When we did this study a few years ago, we looked at high performing companies. The companies had better revenue, better retention, better employee engagement. And those are all metrics that we care about that we would like to achieve. And the companies that, were, that had those metrics the number one thing they were doing differently than everybody else is they were using recognition as part of how they manage and support their employee performance kind of process. They didn't just say, hey, pat on the back, good job. But Sierra, hey, the way you opened up the session today was so professional and so lively and so fun. You did a really great job at that. You made people feel very comfortable. I really appreciate you doing that and I can't wait to see you do it again, right? Or, hey, good job with that. Those are two radically different things. And when a manager does that recognition piece really well, it takes this much more effort, but that much more impact on someone. And last but not least, one of the things that we found in the data is that those managers don't sit around thinking, you know what, Ben's not very good at delegating. So I'm gonna put him in a delegating class and I'm going to um, talk to him about his delegation problem and then maybe we can put, give them some training on delegation too. And like, no, they say, hey, if that's not your strength, we're not gonna spend a whole bunch of time beating you up about it because most people know what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. And if we spend all the time saying, hey, I'm, I spot your weakness, I see what that is, let's talk some more about that. If that doesn't create an environment where people want to thrive and want to, want to come to work. And so those companies who are higher performing they had leaders who focused on the strengths of their team and really drawing those out and enabling them to be their best possible self at work. By the way, those who focused on weaknesses, that was correlated with poor performance as a company. Not just poor performance for an individual, but poor performance as a company when you have a lot of leaders who look at weaknesses and trying to fix those instead of focusing on elevating and supporting the strengths. So we have a chance to do all those kind of things. Quick story. There's a company I got to talk to, um, Gail Jacobs. She's the HR leader over at Garden Health. They are a really cool company. They're a biotech firm. They have 100, maybe 200 employees. And one of the things she was telling me in this conversation, number one, I never heard of the company, so I'm like, what, what do y'all do? She said, you know how if you go to the doctor and they're, they're trying to check you out for cancer, they'll do a biopsy and it's painful and it's invasive and it's, yes, all those things. She said, well, we actually have developed a process with our, our scientists that you can draw blood and do that same test without having to do everything else. So I'm like, that's, that's incredible and amazing what they're doing there. Um, but anyway, she was telling me because they have that, that high tech kind of biotech focus, they have a lot of data scientists, a lot of very specific engineers, things like that on their team to, to do and health professionals to, to do the work. She said, if any one of them leaves, it's a $100,000, $200,000 a year job that we're losing and it's creating this huge gap in what we can achieve. And so they've actually put some things in place where they're proactively looking for what could be triggering someone to be departing. And they found that that one-on-ones are a big part of that. If they, they had a little trial where they had a manager that wasn't doing them, and instead of going in there and you know, shooing them on and said, hey, hey, hurry up and do those things, they said, let's just watch this for a little bit and see what happens. And that manager's team was churning pretty regularly. But this manager over here, same equitable type of role, their team was very stable and they said the only difference they could find was that they were doing those one-on-ones, having those conversations. They're also looking at things like, when was the last time we looked at comp for this person? Did they get recognition? Is their time actually being taken up by, is 90% of the time being spent in meetings? Because we hire these people for their creativity, for their ingenuity, and then we put them in this little box of a meeting and we don't ever let them do any of the work we hired them to do. And that burns them out quickly because they, they don't want to sit in meetings. They want to create and they want to solve real problems. One last thing she said that really stuck me, struck me was when someone leaves, they find that those that are closest connected to them in the business, the ones who work on more projects, the ones who spend more time with them, those people are more likely to leave as well. So if they see someone, they immediately send out kind of a triage team to say, okay, they were connected most with Jan and with Philip. Go and connect with them and make sure if there's anything we can do to make sure they're, they're good right now because we don't want them to leave too. So we're trying to keep that compounding from happening when someone does leave. So I've hit this. It's the last thing I want to talk about one-on-ones, okay? I wanted to give you this as a stat. So what I did is I actually looked at the actual, the methodology behind this is we looked at the median hourly wage for the entire U.S., which is $71,000. 
And then we looked at a set of manager wage of $100,000, just as an example. And then we figured out their working hours. So watch this and see what happens. When we figure out the cost of those two people, that manager and that employee meeting together for 30 minutes once a week for an entire year, based on those median wages, it's about $2,000. Okay, which is an investment. If a manager has 10 people, right, that's, that's going to go up. That's going to start stacking up and costing more money. Absolutely. But the cost of losing one person based on that same median wage could be as much as $35,000. So we're making a decision in the moment to say, yeah, I can't quite get to that one-on-one. -on -one. We'll push that off. We are taking that risk every time that happens and multiply that across every leader, every manager in an organization, and it gets a little mind-boggling about how how much risk we're being exposed to organizationally. So I wanted to share that with you because I've, I've wondered about this for a while and I had a chance to actually dive in and create that, um, create that and see it. So my last thing I want to talk to you about is this evidence we have on employee priorities, the things they're asking for. I'm going to share a fake stat with you just to make sure you're still awake because I threw a bunch of real stats to you earlier. If we listen to the news about where people want to work, we keep getting this picture painted for us that, hey, one out of every hundred people want to work in a physical location. Everybody else wants to be remote. Yep, they want to work from their couch. They want to do the home office thing. They want to, to fold laundry while they're in meetings or whatever the thing is. I don't know what they're saying, but they want to work from home. When we actually asked that question of real workers across multiple different environments. Here's what we found. Those people who are working in a physical location, a job site, maybe they're in construction or they're an educator or they're in retail. Those people, six out of 10 said, hey, I'm, I wanna continue doing this. This is what our, I know, this is what I'm comfortable with. Those people who are working in a hybrid schedule said, I kinda wanna stay this way, six out of 10. And strangely enough, six out of 10 of those that are remote said, I wanna stay remote. I don't wanna go back, I don't wanna change. But it's not everybody and it's not all of them. And if we looked at this by, by gender, by ethnicity, by age, by who has children, like all those kind of things, we'll start to see this falling apart, what we think we know about how people want to work. This one hit me hardest though. We asked a question in a study, what does flexibility mean to you? And for most of us, if I was, if we were just asked without giving a cue here, most of us to say, oh, flexibility will probably means, you know, where someone works because in the conversation in the last two years, every flexibility thing is, oh, we, we're, we're hybrid now, or we work from home, or we work from home two days a week, or that's where the conversation almost always goes. And there's a huge portion of the workforce that does not have that as an option. No one expects to be serving a, a customer at a Kohl's, you know, a department store, sitting on their couch. No one thinks they're going to be driving a forklift, you know, while they're working from home. No one thinks those things are possible. They're not even thinking about that. So the actual where I work when we asked employees to prioritize those things was number five on the list. Number one was I want a little more trust and control. I want some more choice about my work and how it gets done, a little more autonomy in that. That equates to listening to them and trust, caring about what they have to say and what they need from us. Other things in there, benefits, again, we've seen that come up a couple times in the conversation. Having chances to share ideas because guess what? The best ideas in many companies don't always come from the corner office. They come from someone that's at the point of where work gets done. There's a tremendous book called The Idea Driven Organization that focuses all around that and helps us to see how to take more ideas from our people to make incremental and positive change at work. Not only that, one other flexibility thing that we have more control over is careers. Two out of every three employees have quit a job at some point in their career because they didn't see a future trajectory at that company. So if we can help them see what that trajectory is, they're going to stick around. They're going to want to stay. And I mentioned that candidate research we just finished last week. I haven't shared this anywhere. It's brand new. I haven't even looked at all the data myself. Just one of the stats that jumped out at me is when we started asking them, do you want to hear about development opportunities and growth opportunities during the hiring process? Nine out of 10 of those said, yes, absolutely. I want to hear those things right then. Don't wait until after I've started. Don't wait till later. You bring it up to me because I am interested in hearing more about how I can grow. And so I'm really hoping by this point, you understand why I hate that great resignation thing so much because it's causing people like us, people who want to serve, people who want to take care of our workforce and our candidates and our, our leaders, it makes people feel hopeless. 
and I'm hoping that you really understand that there's hope, we have options, we have levers we can pull, we have buttons we can push, pick the metaphor that you like, but we have things we can do to make positive change. So I'm gonna wrap actually with this. We know, if you took that intro psych class in school, you know that there's this response our brains have, the neuroscience of how our brains actually operate. There's a response our brains have when there's danger. It's what, fight or flight, right? That's our, our thing, we have to figure out what to do in that immediate situation. But once that danger has passed, it's, hey, we're safe, we're good. But that's not the highest order of our brain capacity. Because the research says that our brains have been wired for a really long time to always be dedicating a little portion of our mental energy to, yeah, but what if? What if this happens? What if there's danger around the corner? Or what if that tiger jumps out from behind the tree and eats me? You know what? Our brains are wired to be looking for that danger. That's probably unlikely to happen in the workplace for most of us. And so what can we do about it? Well, this higher level that I'm talking about from a neuroscience perspective, the data really reflect this and back it up. When someone feels appreciated, desired, they feel safe and heard. They feel like their employer and their leader directly are listening to them and appreciating them. They can take that, say 10% of their creativity, of their effort, of their focus, of their ability to collaborate with others, they can take that 10% that they're holding back and they can put all of that into their work. So it's not just about keeping our people, it's about keeping our people and keeping them at their very top level of performance, which is an incredible and exciting prospect. So if you wanna ping me, wanna connect, I think we've got a couple minutes for questions potentially, but I just wanna wrap with this really quickly, if you don't mind. Um, in the last two years, I've talked to more and more leaders um, about what's happening in the world out there. And I keep seeing these conversations that say, hey, thank you to the frontline workers, or thank you to our healthcare workers, or to the delivery drivers and all those people. And every time one of those conversations happened, I said, yes, thank you, I appreciate you. But you know who else I appreciate? The HR leaders behind every one of those people who are helping to make sure they're hired, they're trained, they're compliant, they're getting all their stuff taken care of so they can get paid. The HR leaders are never getting that applause, but I see the work you're doing and I appreciate the work you're doing. So thank you so much for letting me join you, for letting me share some encouragement with you. This has been such a joy and a pleasure. And Sierra, I'm gonna turn that back over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. Now you all see why I've been talking to Ben over a year um, because I had wanted him to speak last year, but he was already booked. So I'm so glad this worked out. Um, Always love to hear you speak, Ben. Um, so we do have a we do have a question. One question that's come in. If you have other questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, or you can raise your hand and we'll try to call on you. We just have a couple minutes. Um, so one question is: Is there a difference to the employee about recognition from managers versus HR or upper managers? Ooh, that's a good question. So there is a difference because of that relationship piece, right? Just like um, I'll give you a, a, a interesting corollary. So we asked. In a study, at one study we did, we asked candidates, what kind of video do you want to see in the hiring process? We gave them choices about, do you want to see your, the hiring manager talking about the job or do you want to see an HR recruiter message? Do you want to see the company culture kind of overview which features our senior leaders? HR and recruiting were at the bottom of the list. They didn't, they want to see us least. Sorry, my friends. Number one on that list was, I want to see my future manager. I want to hear from them. I want to understand what's important to them. And I would say that same thing applies here. They want to see and hear and feel what that person has to say. Because if it was just up to us, honestly, we would figure that one out. We would find a way to go around and say, hey, thank you, thank you, we love you, you're great, yes, great job. We would do those things because we take all the burden on ourselves. We're the first ones to say, oh, that's no one else's job, we'll do it. So we're the ones that will take that on. We can't do that for them. We can give them tools, we can give them encouragement, we can give them a process, I don't care if it's I'm putting it on your calendar so every Thursday at two o'clock, you are making your rounds and talking to your people, whether it's in person or virtually, I don't care, but talk to them. Well, isn't that mechanical? Yes, but you're building a habit and until you build that habit, I'm gonna make it feel mechanical and I'm gonna prod you and poke you and encourage you and say, hey, did you talk to your people this week? Because I think that's so critical. And so we can't do that for them. And yes, executive leaders hearing from other people, appreciating them broadly, but to get really specific, that manager knows them better than anybody else. And they're the ones whose voice is gonna matter the most. Excellent. I'm 
if there's no other questions, if you have a question, last call. I could not watch all the chat coming through earlier. It was kind of it was kind of buzzing through, and so I knew I, I wanted to make sure miss any any of the good stuff. So, um, yeah, we're at time. So thank you, everybody. Again, I pop my email up there at the very end, and Sierra will make sure and share that out afterwards. If anyone wants to reach out, has a question, anything else, thank you so much again for what you're doing. It's incredible. It's noteworthy work, and it needs to get done. So I celebrate every single one of you, and honored to be here with you today. So much, Ben. We really appreciate you joining us. And really quick, what's your podcast called? The, oh, excuse me. Got choked up there for a second. Uh, the <laughs> podcast is called We're Only Human. You can find that at onlyhumanshow.com. And it's interviews with HR leaders about what they're doing, how they're facing the challenges. And so there's always some good advice and suggestions there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. We really appreciate you. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, we are going to um, keep on rolling. So thank you so much. Okay, everybody, I am going to quickly share my screen one more time. We are going to hear from our first breakout sponsor, New Front. We'll let that go. New Front is here to make insurance work for you. It starts by saying no, no to slow. No to paperwork. No to disparate data. No to searching. No to checking the box. No to being put in a box. No to wasting time. No to uncertainty. No to being held back. No to doing it all again next year. No to broken promises. No to technology without relationships. No to relationships without technology. No to insurance as usual. When we say no to the things that limit us, we can create new things that work for us. Insurance risk management and employee benefits experts supercharged with cutting edge technology. A better direction, a better decision, a better deal, a better day starts here. New Front. Thank you so much New Front for sponsoring today. We will say thank you to, oops, sorry about that. Here's how the virtual benefits fair works on Airbo. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and go to the break, um, and we will put up the slide to return at 1015. Uh, so we're going to say thank you to our break sponsor, and we will see everybody back at 1015 for the breakouts. All right, everybody can head to the break. We'll see you shortly.
day preparing for this. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about my love, which is HR. Um, I view HR as a superpower. I have a true belief that proper HR practices can change the world. Uh, that may sound a little silly to some, but I but I will walk you through my thought process today. Um, so first of all, the reason I, I see HR as a superpower is because from a business perspective, we had the advantage of really infiltrating in a very positive way um, all areas of the business. Uh, we own candid experience, um, and we also can look into customer experience. We can look at the business processes and really impact the bottom line. Um, over the years, often I've seen that there are some HR units that function as HR units um, standalone and they implement their best practices and they do a good job uh, of being HR. But the challenge there is that um, you're not being as um, powerful as you can be because truly HR has the power to become a, a business partner in every sense of the word. And um, I think that by being able to, to support the business and really understand it, you can play a much bigger role. So there are two ways to kind of play this HR game in my mind. You can kind of sit at the kitty table and you can, um, you know, uh, tick all the boxes and, and kind of just plug away and be looked at as a cost center by your CFO, or you can um, work with the business, act as a support function, uh, truly across the enterprise. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit about what I mean by that. And, um, and really help by, you know, becoming a partner to your business rather than just another business area that is specialized in a certain, uh, in a certain way. Um, and so, yeah, I think one of the biggest, um, the most impactful thing that I ever heard was from my one of my um, previous CEOs, who is now a mentor of mine. And he always said, look, my job is to transform HR from a cost center to a profit center. And that was really profound for me because I started to think about how we as HR members can do that. And um, and once you start to think that way and start to, to run your HR function that way, you're really able to impact every part of your business. So... I'm going to keep this conversation very casual. Uh, I'm going to allow time for questions in the end, but if you have a question um, during the session, please just feel free to, to go ahead and ask it. Um, we're all friends here. Okay. So again, the reason I think HR um, is a superpower of sorts is because I've quite frankly been allowed to work in every aspect of the business I can think of from business operations all the way to product uh, testing. And the way that you kind of touch on that is to understand the various business areas and really start to look into them and understand that the basic HR functions that you perform are absolutely vital, but they're almost like breathing for us. They're second nature. So it's not, um, it's not too much to ask to kind of step beyond that. So what I mean Exactly. Is, you know, if you look at something like business performance, um, sometimes we, we tend to think that business performance means that we have to ensure that our PM reviews go through, that we, uh, you know, ensure that the organization is covered and that we put the information in the system. And then, you know, we flag when people are doing, you know, well or not well and reward, etc. But I, I think it's important to to ask ourselves as as HR individuals, do we understand our business, or are we in fact in an HR bubble and doing HR for the sake of HR? And the way that you kind of have to think about that is, is really to kind of speak the language of the business, you know, investigate the breaks in the process. How, how are you kind of sitting shoulder to shoulder with your operations manager, understanding where are the kinks in your business? What are the things that are roadblocks for you? And then kind of reverse engineering them to understand, are there any people elements here that we as HR can help you solve? Because then you truly become valuable to that organization. Um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity that I've seen, a missed opportunity that I've seen um, in the HR space when it comes to business performance and uh, being the people to identify inefficiencies in process, um, to look for elements to fix, um, 
I will give you an example, um, kind of where this idea of, you know, HR being these superheroes is once I was assigned a project um, in a call center and I was told that the problem that they were having was that uh, people didn't know what they were doing. The call center agents didn't know what they were doing. And so I was given the mandate to terminate a large number of people and then to uh, utilize the learning and development budget to um, kind of help everybody else become smarter at their job. And what I ended up doing and, and finding was that um, I, first of all, I requested a little bit of time because the business told me what they thought the problem was, but I didn't um, know that for sure. So I asked for a little bit of time. So I sat down with my team and we sat in and listened in on calls. We listened in on customers. We, we tried to understand what is really happening here. And we were able to find out that in fact, our call center agents were top notch when it came to their knowledge. So there was not a knowledge gap. So there was no need to utilize L&D budgets um, for this problem, which is not really the issue. And so when we dug in further, we then saw that people were dropping calls and rushing our customers through, almost being short with them or a little bit rude. And we didn't understand why. Um, we also had a very high level of attrition in this particular call center. And so we started to speak to our agents and really understand what's going on here in these three areas. Like, why are you dropping calls? We know it's not the technology that's doing it. It's you that's doing it. Um, why are you treating our customers this way and kind of rushing them through? And then finally, why are you leaving us? Um, and what we ended up finding was that the way that the rewards and recognition structure was uh, built, they were actually incentivized to um, have the quickest call possible. So we were rewarding them. So our HR structure was rewarding them to in fact, be short with our, with our clients, right? And it's one of those things where it just, it was created at some point by an HR team that thought they were implementing a best practice from somewhere, it was not revisited and it was hurting not only our, our customers, but it was hurting our people because they said, you know, we understand what our job is. We want to do a good job, but we're not given the opportunity because if I don't, if I go over and spend a little bit more time with my client, I'm actually going to lose out on my incentives. So it doesn't make sense to me. So either they do that and they hurt the client and they get their incentives um, or they're just, they're tired and they leave us. And then we have attrition to deal with and attrition, as you all know, is extremely costly and, and really, really bad for morale. So that's kind of where I really understood that, oh, okay. Um, as HR, we can actually go in and help the transformation team or whomever else diagnose these issues that are their fundamental breaks in our people practices, as well as kind of like creating a snowball effect into our technology and, and our customer um, experience. Um, another area that we need to look into if we're really going to be um, effective is um, people performance. And so instead of administering ratings and thinking that, um, you know, making sure that our performance management calendar is met and that all the, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are, are, are crossed, we need to look into and constantly review our performance management um, design. So what I mean specifically is that the, how, what is the soundness of the design? Was it something that was created in conjunction with the business? Is it something that is actually aligned to bring our strategy to where it needs to be, our business strategy? And that's what I mean when I say that we need to speak the language of the business. Um, because asking your people and your business their thoughts on, on the way that they should be rated and the way that they should be managed is valuable. I'm not saying that it should be designed based exactly on what they want, but their inputs need to be incorporated into that. And again, in some, in some instances that's happening, but in some instances we have systems that we use that we potentially purchase and we just are in the business of making sure the rollout happens correctly and that you know PM closes on this particular date, everybody's gotten in and we're good. Right. So now we can do our payouts and we could kind of do all that stuff, which is extremely important. But we're missing the point here, the point of having a performance management 
process is to increase performance and better our business and not to do the process to check the boxes. Um, I also wonder, um, you know, if we're looking very deeply into, let's say we understand that our process is up to date and it is useful to the business and to the strategy and is very much in line. Are we digging deep and making it our business to make sure that our people understand how to go ahead and use that? Um, I've heard, unfortunately, a lot from different people in different organizations that the only time that they speak to their manager is when performance management is happening. So once every six months or once every year, depending on the cycles that they have. Um, when you speak to managers about this too, they they feel that they're very burdened with work and that this is something that they can do off the side of their desk. And I think that it behooves us as HR to kind of instill that understanding of the importance here, because if you do this correctly, Mr. or Mrs. Manager, you're actually going to have better business performance and it's going to make your job a lot easier. And I think that is something that is kind of like the needle is moving, but we're still not there yet. Um, the amount of times that people actually have feedback discussions on a regular basis is very, um, is very low. And then also there's this negative connotation when it comes to feedback, because I don't know about all of you, but sometimes um, the only time you get feedback is when you're in trouble. Uh, you don't get feedback to tell you how great you did. Um, and so there's this negative uh, connotation with feedback. And also I've, um, in my capacity as a coach, I've sat to observe some of these feedback sessions and I see that what is happening is not feedback at all. And so it, it, it is something that I question in terms of what is the organizational maturity or readiness to be giving feedback. So as HR, are we making sure that while we have these rules in place and the system in place, we're creating the environment that is able to properly function within it? Are we teaching our people how to give feedback and the importance of it, how to receive it? Um, and when we see that it's not happening well, what are we doing about it? Um, so that's something that's extremely important as well. I think uh, we have to ask ourselves, are people getting feedback often? We have to ask our people if they're getting feedback often. Um, do they know how to how to receive it and what to do with it? More importantly, once you get it, you know, it's not one of those things that you hear and then you don't action. And I think that's kind of where HR needs to kind of step over that line where it's like, okay, well, well, we're either observing or we taught them once, but you have to continuously do it and re and re-examine whether it's working or not. If you have pockets where it's working really well, what are you doing to showcase these pockets of excellence? How are you making sure that you're working closely with your communications team to broadcast that? Um, and so you kind of create that momentum in the organization. Um, and then I wonder too, you know, do we ask ourselves often enough if we're if we're tracking any of these things. So if we are tracking them, what are the parameters that we're tracking and do they make sense? Or are we just, are we tracking parameters because we, we thought that they were important at one time, but have we revisited whether or not they make sense today? Um, and so those are areas that I think we need to look at if we really are to kind of be the saviors of the organization. And, and I think we really could be. I have seen where, um, the HR function, like I said in the beginning, plays a very important role, but it's very limited um, versus where you're sitting at the table. And we hear this a lot in many conferences, you know, we need a seat at the table. Well, I think that seat is something you have to earn. And so if you're not making sense to your CFO, or if you don't even know what your CFO needs, then you need to kind of figure out how you can start to um, uh, speak the language of the business. You need to educate yourself first and then make sure that your HR team is able to manage and, and behave as true business partners to the organization. Um, I saw a question in the chat that popped up. One moment. So Kim, um, in terms of resources on how to train managers to coach versus just giving feedback, I think it's important to, to educate ourselves, like I say first, so right? Um, so coaching is used to get people from good to great, okay? Um, 
So you need to first identify, you know, what's happening in your organization, because in terms of resources, there's plenty of resources out there that can teach you the basics of coaching the basics of feedback, how to give it. Um, but I think when it comes to this area, sometimes what happens is it gets a little bit convoluted. We talk about coaching, we talk about mentoring, we talk about, um, uh, you know, performance management, and then we talk about um, uh, the the the, the more difficult employees. So I've been in situations, for example, where people were like, oh my gosh, this person is really difficult. They need coaching. And in fact, they don't. Because like I said, coaching is to get people from good to great. So if you have a really great employee, you need to spend time coaching them to get to the next level. And in terms of what methodology you would be using, it, there's there's a bunch of methodology out there, uh, depending on which school you look at. I personally ascribe to the... Um, the coaching, the International Coaching Federation. So if you look up the ICF, there's a lot of really great information there on how to conduct coaching in the appropriate way. And there's various models. And of course, if you are uh, looking to get certified, I would highly uh, recommend that. I think it's a really great experience. Um, and then in terms of feedback, I think one of the biggest challenges that I've seen is that people don't know how to give proper feedback. Um, maybe they they know the techniques, right? We've heard the sandwich method and all of that stuff, but they don't know the basics like timing, right? If I'm having a really bad day and I'm really busy and I'm running out the door and you're like, hey, let me give you some feedback, not the time to do it. So I'm not really teaching these people the basics of it. How do you use this in, in, a, in an everyday situation? What if something happens in that moment and you need to give feedback? The first thing I would ask you is, have you taken the time to learn how people like to get to receive feedback? Have you asked them? And if the question is, no, I didn't know I had to do that, you need to, right? Because I might be someone who's extremely private and who wants to have feedback uh, privately, or I may be someone who uh, personally, I need feedback immediately. I don't want you to wait. So, so as an HR member, um, you need to first understand how people like to receive feedback. And this all happens through conversation. And then in terms of the methods, you can do a quick Google search. As I said, there's a, the sandwich method, um, but but in general, feedback is pretty simple. Uh, tell people what you observe, not what you're, not what you think they intended to do, because that's not feedback. That's criticism, um, and just let them know what you observed, and then you know, figure out from their perspective what they thought was happening, and go from there. And the purpose of feedback always has to be with the intent to grow. Right. We're not giving feedback to people with the intent to punish or anything like that, because if you have an employee and this is like the third element that I mentioned, uh, an employee who has issues, you have to question whether or not this is a performance discussion. Right. Uh, not a feedback discussion. So I think it's important for us to also be able to suss it out. Um, we can fall into the trap that. Um, well, we, we don't want to, we don't want to be mean. We want to like, you know, help people and we want to do this. That's great. But there's, there, it's like going to the doctor, right? He can't give you an aspirin for, for a broken leg. Like you have to figure out what tool you need to use. And that's where educating ourselves as, as HR members is important. Um, but going back to, again, why I think we're superheroes. Um, and so, pardon me, I have all my notes here. Uh, I look like a mad scientist, but I was drawing out all of the different areas that we touch on every day and then how simplistic or deep you can go into them. So we talked about business performance. I talked about people performance. I want to go into the aspect of well-being. So well-being is a topic that is, is really hot right now, which is wonderful. And I'm really glad that we're one positive thing that has come out of COVID is that people are starting to, to take the conversation seriously about well-being and health and mental health. Um, but in terms of well-being, you know, it can be very surface level. And I've seen this when I've, when I've done previous client engagements where they have a fun run and they have, you know, uh, um, we celebrate birthdays, even now virtually. But I, I do question often and the answers that I get are a little concerning in terms of like, how well do you know your people? How often, how many hours do you spend uh, with kind of like a, an open um well, I would say open office, but, but, you know, office hours virtually even to, to sit and get to know what's really happening with your people. Um, how, what, what is the level of their well-being? And, and you'd be surprised uh, at this, at some of the answers that I get. It's, well, we don't spend 
any time with them or like, why do we need to spend time with them? We have these fun birthday celebrations and we send them these wonderful packages and we have gift cards and we have burgers and we have all this, you know, pizza party virtually where we send people. And I'm like, that's not, that's not uh, it. So we need to really look beyond surface level. Um, I wonder if we as HR as well need to start kind of digging into uh, what we do in terms of well-being and the education we give the businesses. Um, because I think it's important to kind of go beyond that surface level. And I'll give you an example. I had a conversation right before this um, with a client of mine who's a CEO of a consulting firm. And one of the things that they are doing, which I think is amazing, is um, they actually had a staff member who, uh, we, sorry, we were talking about their well-being um, programs and things like that. And so they had a staff member who lost a child and um, they gave this person time off and they, you know, did everything that was within the, the well-being policy, but they, they went a step further. So their, their HR teams were thinking about how can we make this as, as, positive an experience in such a horrible circumstance. So they actually brought a psychologist from the outside to work with that individual, as well as work with the team internally to know how to handle this individual when they come back. Um, and so that's where I think understanding the, the unique nature of your people and what they need and where they are helps really with creating wellness that matters to them, right? Giving me a Fitbit, and having a little competition on how many steps I walk may not matter. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was very supportive. And the, the, I mean, there is no coming. I mean, that situation is horrible, right? But what can you do? And I, I really believe it's, it's, it's a credit to the CEO because nobody would have known unless the, the CEO was constantly speaking to people. And this is something that is, is really great because it was that, that leadership kind of walking the talk and is always, you know, ear to the ground knows what's happening with people. And so that really helped create this momentum and HR felt that they could come up with ideas that were outside of the box, not like, well, these are our policies and we're giving them the max. So they should be happy with that. It was really, what more can we do? What more can we do? And, and, and quite frankly, um, it doesn't always have to happen at a massive cost. Not sometimes not a cost at all. You just become creative, Re go out on LinkedIn and say, Hey, we need this. And you'd be surprised how many people will raise their hand because they care about it and they'll, they'll just do it for you for free. Um, so that's kind of, again, I, I always go back to this, you know, how deep do you want to go as HR, right? And that's the difference between having a great HR person versus a nice HR person. And I think we all want to be great HR people. Um, so then, so well-being is one part and that's the individual well-being, right? But then I also question um, if we're doing a good enough job in terms of social well-being and specifically beyond the employee and their self. Um, what are, what are you all? And what, you know, I ask myself this question too, what am I looking at in terms of kind of creating this environment? Um, do we have family or partner or, um, anything like that where we're kind of like bringing in the whole person? Because, you know, you might, as let's say I'm your employee, um, you might give me benefits for my partner and my children and whatnot, but how involved are they? in my life with the organization. And I remember I was on a, um, an engagement in India and there is a company there that does this so well. And the name is Tata Group, T-A-T-A. -A. And they will give you all the benefits that we think are, you know, the standard, you know, like you get healthcare for your, in, your spouse and whatnot, but the focus is on creating a community. So there's a lot of family events. There's a lot of, um, you know, oh, your, your child is in the fifth grade. Well, we have an internship program for kids who are 12 years old. Make sure they sign up and they get very involved in all aspects of your life. And what that ends up doing is creating this employee who really feels like you are part of their family. 
not because you say, oh, we're family, but because you're showcasing that through the things that you do through work functions. Um, you don't take the individual away from their family. You bring their family into the company almost. Um, and so what I found when I was speaking to one of the um, leaders there was he was like, you know, Aisha, we don't have a problem with attrition because our employees are happy, um, but more so their families are very happy as well. So they have um, kind of like this, this loyalty times two, um, and they offer a lot of benefits to the families that quite frankly, they, they don't have to pay for. They offer uh, social circles, for, for example, if there's um, a, a partner who's staying at home, they offer that and they create like these little, like almost like a meetup group, right, for all of them. And, and all these really creative ways um, in which their HR has looked at how do we involve every aspect of this employee's life into this company. So it doesn't really feel like work. You know, we say often uh, treat the company money like it's your own. But that's kind of hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Um, and when I spoke to employees on the ground, they're like, this is my home. Like, I will do everything for them. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So that was that was something that really stood out to me um, when we talk about well-being. It increases that engagement level, reduces the attrition. And, and it happens so naturally when you take that time to figure out what's important to your people. And um, also continuously checking on that, because if you have certain um, individuals who are with you for a longer time, you know, what was important to them a couple of years ago, if they were single, is different once they're married or once they're, you know, having children or once, you know, maybe they have an illness now or so it always changes. And the only way that you can know what the right thing is to do is to constantly be communicating. So I really believe that 80% of our job as HR is to be listening and communicating with our people. Um, and the rest is just, you know, it's like breathing. You have to do it. Um, so in terms of then moving on to like growth and development, I think that's absolutely vital. Um, and I want to I want to clarify that when I say growth and development, I'm not talking about the LND function only, right? So we, the LND function is absolutely important. But I wonder um, if we are creating options um, for our people at every single level. Are we offering? Um, uh, the formal and informal. I think that oftentimes, um, at least from, again, I started out in, in uh, operations and then moved to L&D. And there was this mindset that, you know, learning was sitting in a training, right? And if I didn't go through a training throughout the year, then, well, the company didn't put me in training. And I realized very quickly that, you know, there had to be an education campaign around that's not the only type of learning that there is. I mean, have you looked at other things like mentoring now today? We have podcasts, we have all of these TEDx's and you know, all of these, I mean, information overload. But how are you as an HR um, expert creating opportunities, creating awareness around those opportunities, encouraging people, working with their management to, to get protected hours for them so that they can go out and explore other areas of the business or do something um, if they're in more of a creative uh, or product uh, type area that they could spend that time kind of coming up with new ideas. So how are you using your influence as HR to create that environment for those people to be able to focus on growth and development? I think we have to also um, not underestimate the fact that we have to nudge these things. Um, it's not like you're telling people anything new. It's just that all of us get extremely busy. We all have deadlines to meet. And oftentimes the person who suffers the most is yourself, right? So as, a, as an individual employee, you, um, you kind of neglect your development and you're kind of like waiting for someone to tell you, okay, now it's time for to go for training, right? You have to go to that. And um, we tend to do a good job when it comes to compliance related things because we have to report that. But how often are we looking at, uh, you know, what this person aspires to do, whether or not they have a unique skill set that we can utilize. You know, how do you create that that learning mindset and that learning environment um, beyond just, hey, we have a really great LMS with like a thousand trainings that you can go into. Great. 
That's wonderful. Are you looking at the data? Who's using it? Do you have power users? Are you um, writing stories about them and talking about how great they are, interviewing them, sharing? You know, it, it's just again, how deep how deep are you going? And I think that's kind of like the point I'm trying to make here. Um, also, I think one thing that um, we need to do more of is have these always on type of share your voice surveys, if you will, where people can share what they think is going well, what they think we need to stop, start and continue um, so that we know. And you can actually like create specific ones for specific areas if that's helpful, or you can have one for everything, but I wouldn't do that. I've done that before and it was a nightmare to kind of suss through. <laughs> um, but it really helped because when we asked people to give us their voice and they did, and then we said, hey, you know, we heard you, this is what you said. And by the way, these are the things we're doing based on what you told us. The engagement levels were amazing. Um, so that's that's something that I think we need to do more of. I think that we do a pretty good job, but we need to do more of. And I think also it's important to make sure that you're communicating what you're doing, because I've seen a lot of HR teams do. The, I mean, the work that they're doing is fantastic and they are listening to their people and they're taking their suggestions. But what they fail to do is to let people know what's happening in the background. And so people are sitting there frustrated, feeling like my voice is going into a black hole. What's the point of even engaging? So that communication bit is so, so important. Um, I think also looking at areas, um, as someone who recently moved overseas um, and was living the expat life, um, the candidate experience, you know, we, I mean, this is something, this is HR 101, we, we talk about um, how do we attract candidates, how do we do that stuff, but are we really thinking, oh, excuse me, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> um, what are we doing to delight, right? We talk about customer delight all the time, but what are we doing to delight our candidates, whether or not they come on board? So from the moment that the moment of awareness of your organization, what are they hearing? What are they feeling? What are they experiencing? Whether they want to, you know, whether they're applying or they're looking at your website, are they seeing your people, not stock images? Are they seeing your people? Are they hearing from them? Um, if they happen to bump into an employee of yours, what would they hear? Have, you know, that's, uh, that's stuff that HR has the power to influence. And oftentimes I feel like we, uh, we, we don't take that as seriously as we should, because it, it is very, very powerful. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story um, that made this very real for me. I was in Barcelona. And um, I was in a random cafe um, waiting for a friend of mine. And there was this couple who was, they were, they looked like they were having a really great time. And they were speaking English and I spoke English and, you know, that kind of just happened. And, um, and they were both really excited and they were talking and I'm like, so what are you guys like doing here? And they're, they're on a conference for Pepsi and they both worked at Pepsi and they were husband and wife. They met at Pepsi. And this, the way that they talked about their organization and their experience, like I wanted to join Pepsi the next day, right? So what is that story that your people are telling when they're outside of your organization? And how are you utilizing your, your HR power to, to make that a positive story, right? And then um, I think just, just talking about the candidate experience, it really needs to be something that we think about holistically. So I'm sure every one of you in this room, right? Just by a show of, can we do hands? Can we do hands, Sierra? I'm not sure. Maybe, okay. We just should be able to. Hands. Yeah, just by yeah, a show of hands. How many of you have had that um, experience where you're you know, doing a job search and you upload your resume and then you have to re-enter your entire resume into the system? Or you can also pop in the chat if you want to. There you go. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, when I talk to my HR folks, they're like, yeah, but it's the system that we have. And I'm like, well, you should go talk to your CEO and let them know how many candidates they are losing because of that. And, and truthfully, the candidates that you lose are the ones who have other options. They're the really good ones that you want, right? Um, I have a girlfriend of mine 
She is, you know, all of the boxes that we love, like Harvard graduate, attorney, this, that, the other thing, you know, and she, there was this organization she really wanted to, to become part of. And they, they had that and she lost it. She's like, I cannot do this. I will not do this. Um, and I remember just like, well, well, why? And she's like, look, if the entry process is this hard, can you imagine the bureaucracy I'm going to have to deal with once I'm in there? And this was a person who had a lot of options. So I, I just thought, well, this is the kind of candidate that you want. So how are you making this candidate's experience better? Um, so that's something that, you know, we, we, we can't control it because, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, look, this is the system we have. They refuse to change it. But I would love to be a fly on the wall just to see how often that conversation is being had and being pushed, right? So as HR, we have to have that moral courage because that's our job to say, this is not working. This is making people mad, right? Um, and the same thing with, with the candidate experience once they're in the organization, right? So how are we making sure that, you know, entering your performance data is not a nightmare? So I, I would ask a lot of my HR clients, like, so how, how often have you actually gone through the process yourself? Have you tried it? Like, you know, have you, they're like, no, we don't need to do that. You know, we'd go on the back end. I'm like, oh, okay. So you have the secret passcode to, to surpass the system, but not everybody else does. So what do you think that's doing? So that those are just like little things that we need to think about to really make a difference. And then I'll, finally, the, the end the, or the, you know, the tail end of the employee experience is what are you doing, if anything, with your alumni? How are you managing their exits? Are they, uh, do they want to come back? Are they able to come back? I remember once I was working on a project um, in a financial institution where they had a policy and I, I'm not making this stuff up. They had a policy where if you left the organization, regardless of why, uh, even if you were you know, a star best employee, you were not allowed to be rehired for a year. I remember looking at that and thinking, that's insane. Uh, when I asked the CEO why and the CHRO why, they were like, I, I don't know. It's just a policy. Nobody had thought to dig into the policies and figure out why do we have that? Does it still serve a purpose? Um, I understand there's a lot of regulations in the financial world, but that, you know, they're... There's other ways to manage it, right? And what they were doing essentially is blocking talent off. I mean, I would love to, if somebody left me who was a rock star, I want to leave the door wide open for them to come back. And then also, how are you managing your alumni, right? So let's say you have somebody who's at, who's a great um, employee, but they are at retirement. They just, they're done. All of that knowledge goes with them. What are you doing? You might say, well, we have a knowledge bank, you know, what? but well, what if we go a step further and create more of a social element where our uh, retired employees can come in and, get, and be part of our LND, like pro bono sometimes? Like you would be surprised at some of the really creative stuff that I've seen out there um, in terms of what people are doing for their alumni and with their alumni, particularly the retired alumni. It, it is amazing. And, and more often than not, they're, they're like, yes, absolutely. I want to come back and do something. And they do it for free. So I'm like, wow, this is a real missed opportunity. Um, so that's kind of where HR needs to kind of step up and really think outside the box. And also, I have to step back and say, it's unfair to assume that your HR function, while they're doing everything they have to do to make sure people are paid and people are safe and all of that stuff, can think of all of these great ideas as well. So what do you do? Talk to your people. Ask them what they think. They have brilliant ideas. You would be surprised at just the level of like um, innov innovative, creative ways that, that they want to interact with each other or they, they, you know, or things or people that they know that could come into the organization and do something really great, you know, for free. Again, as I say, I know we're, we're very, you know, tight on budgets right now, but um, I think it, I think it's a really um, important thing to kind of just be able to step back and say, okay, well, we can't do this all ourselves. So who can we partner with to kind of make our employee experience and our our employer brand top notch? Um, it's 
it's interesting because the stuff that I'm talking about, right? If you're able to, to really look at every phase of these pillars that you manage from the employee life cycle, right? From the moment they enter or from the moment of awareness till, till they leave. And there's all of that stuff in between. And then you look at your customer experience and your customer delight. And then you look at your business strategy. If you can take the time to think about why are we doing this again? Does it still make sense? No. Okay, let's not be afraid to stop, right? And let's talk to our people and let's hear what's working and what's not. And you're really digging deep and diving deep into it. You are automatically creating a culture of innovation. You are creating a culture that is going to advance. Um, and I say that because I, I sometimes wonder and worry that we are so obsessed with we want to have a really great culture. We want our culture to be really healthy. We want, you know, our culture to be this, our culture to be that. But your culture, it, 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 your culture happens because a bunch of people got together and they're working together, right? You are the custodian as HR of culture. So you should understand what your vision, mission, values are and your business strategy and how they all link together. And by the way, side note, if your vision, mission, values don't link up to your business strategy, meaning they don't help bring it over the line, then you need to revisit them. Just that little public service announcement. But if, if you are doing all these things where you're constantly digging in and fixing what's not working and evolving as the business is evolving because you're listening to everybody, your employees, your customers, your business, et cetera, you're creating that culture of learning, of curiosity, of we're not gonna cover up mistakes because we're okay to, we're okay to pivot right? You're, you're allowing for that. And again, I go back to it. HR is the superhero because you will lead the way, right? Um, during the pandemic, I think HR really showcased how strong and powerful they are. I mean, I remember when it, when it was February of 2020, I don't even know the dates anymore, but when it was in, and this was like whispers of maybe something coming, by, by April, I feel like I became an epidemiologist. Like everybody would ask me, so wait, wait a minute, how is this transmitted? How, and HR became the star of the show. Um, and it just, it really showcased, I think also to the business that we were involved in everything. We were involved in building security. We were involved in, you know, making sure everybody gets vaccinated. We were, every part of the business became our problem, right? They all came to us. And that's how it should be all the time. They should have that level of trust that if we don't know how to do it, we need to involve HR. Um, and so you create that culture. And of course, like, I'm not saying you shouldn't focus on culture in terms of your behavioral competencies, et cetera, but it should be all of that stuff that's happening as well as these behavioral competencies, which create this culture, as opposed to doing culture for the sake of culture, where we say we want everyone to walk around with a red hat on and smile, um, but everything else is kind of counterintuitive to that. Um, so constant evolution and relevance, no fear in pivoting and just saying, we were really certain about this. We're not so certain anymore because we tried it and our people hate it and we're gonna stop. And um, that, that might not be very popular with your, your board, especially if they've invested a little bit of money in there, but you have to, sh you have to be able to, to speak confidently about the numbers to say, well, look, if we keep going, this is what's gonna happen. You can show them, the numbers, how the, how the numbers are going to get impacted with attrition, with low engagement scores, with et cetera, et cetera, right? You can't just be like, well, we started it. Now we got to go with it. Um, and I think that's important because you really do, as the custodian of the culture of the organization, you really do showcase what's acceptable, what's, what's not. And then I'm just going to uh, kind of wrap up with the fact that... Um, HR is responsible. And I know everybody says this, like, yeah, of course, of course they are. Um, but HR is responsible to make sure that nobody is above the law in our organizations, from the C-suite to mid-level to your frontline associates. Everybody has to live the values. Everybody has to perform. Everybody has to be patted on the back when they're doing a good job. Um, everybody's voice is important. And if we are not actively doing that, if we hear whispers of bad behavior from a senior leader, 
And we're like, uh, but you know, yes, we believe in healthy cultures, but that person is kind of off limit. I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. We really have to learn our stuff, understand our business strategy, understand what our board requires, and any person or process or program that is getting in that getting in the way of that, we need to be able to respectfully call out and come up with solutions for. Um, because if we don't, then everything, if you do everything that I said and dig deep and everywhere, but people start to see that the rules apply to some people, but not to others. Yeah, you might as well just not do anything um, because it will totally take away from your credibility and take away from all the great stuff that you're working so hard to do. So that is why I believe HR is a bunch of superheroes because we can do it all. We just have to make sure that we're prioritizing the right stuff and really um, focusing on, uh, you know, what, what is important versus what's kind of like second nature and like breathing in, in the HR world. So I'm open for any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Aisha. We do have um, a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to start with one that we came, that came in already. Um, but if you have questions for Aisha, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and I will uh, make sure she sees those. So now is the time, ask away. Uh, so the question that we got in was, how do you think the company size has an effect on what is possible? Oh, great question. Um, it definitely, it, it, it's not, there's not one company size that is like, this is the right size of the organization, but it's definitely important to keep that in mind because it's like trying to drive a ship, right? If you have a ship with 80,000 people versus a thousand people, the impact of what you're trying to do, um, the time that that happens is much longer or shorter, depending on how many people you have. But I think it's important when you are part of a big organization to buddy up even more because you need all these champions who are, cause you can't hire an army, right? As, as HR. So you need to ensure you're finding these informal leaders and these champions who are, who understand and kind of get what you're trying to do and work with them so they can become mouthpieces for, for the change that you're trying to implement. And I will say too, that you, we need to remember, and I forget this all the time because I, I'm like, oh my God, I lose my patience. But when implementing change, no matter where you are, no matter what company you're in, you have to say it and say it again and say it again and remind people. And then maybe you'll see little tiny incremental changes happen over time. Awesome. Okay. Does anybody else have questions? We have Aisha ready for your questions. So feel free to pop those into the chat we have a few more minutes I will just say one thing while people are thinking of their questions you know everything that we do is is for our people is for our organization I think that's wonderful but one of the things we have to remember as well is that we are also staff of that organization and so we have to also make sure that we're building our own internal capability as well as our internal capability, right? So if I run a team, I may be a great boss in HR and I'm like helping my team grow, but how much am I growing? I think that's really important. Um, and one of the things that I recommend every single HR person do, I don't care what level you're at, you need to have a development plan for yourself and you constantly need to be growing because if you're not doing that, then you are in no position to tell people that they need to develop themselves and they need to learn new skills and they need to be open-minded and et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Well, and everybody attending today is uh, is right there making some um, some steps by just attending know, today yeah. and learning. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's it really interesting uh, to hear a lot of what you had to say really correlated with what Ben said earlier in terms of um, you know mentors and influencing others. And he also shared a lot about that engagement piece. So um, you guys really paired very nicely today. <laughs> Couldn't have planned that better. Um, all right. Well, thank you. If there's no other questions, uh, we will move right along. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha, for being here. Thank you guys. And sharing with us. It was amazing to have you um, with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn it right on over to our president, Nicole Series, who is going to close out our day for us. Thank you, Sierra. 
I thought it was amazing speakers. I want to share a few takeaways um, that I jotted down, and then I'd love for you, for everyone in the chat, to put what their takeaway, whether it's just something um, that reassured you that you're on the right track or something you plan to implement. We'd love to hear a takeaway from you. Some of mine are, you know, just making sure that the leaders are doing the one-on-ones and really seeing that cost slide from Ben was very eye-opening. We're big on one-on-ones, so just reinforcing those. The flexibility of, you know, that's such a key word and term, and that flexibility means different things for different people. So really um, honing in there and understanding what, what that means. Um, that coaching gets people good to great. I love that. But I also love the participant, which I, if Tiffany's still on here, when she spoke up and shared about her best experience with her boss and that you don't have to choose between your kids and that job, like how powerful that is. And then it was even shared again in our wellness breakout session of what powerful words that is and what a powerful role HR plays. So I'd love to see some of these. Um, yeah, see the chat over here. Anyone want to share some takeaways? I also just love when Aisha said um, 80% is listening and communicating. Uh, it's just such a great reminder that uh, HR holds such an important space when it comes to listening and giving people the opportunity to share. Absolutely. It was such a roundup of great speakers and breakout sessions, and I can't wait to hear more from the breakout sessions that we weren't part of. Um, Sierra and the marketing team, I just want to send a huge thank you to all the hard work in putting this on every year. You are outstanding and you just you, you nailed it. So thank you so much. Um, and then also another big thank you to our sponsors, um, Providence and Western Health Advantage, Aero Benefits, Hannah Brophy, Exchange Bank, and Innovative Business Solutions. Our conference wouldn't be going on without your support, and we are truly appreciative. And we love that you participate um, and are able to share your knowledge with our HR leaders here today. So thank you so much. And that concludes our 2022 HR Summit. So thank you all for attending and you will get a poll. So we would love to hear your feedback. We're always looking at ways that we can make this better. Um, so please do share, um, be candid with that feedback. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.